through 124 naturally on Earth, someplace in Africa, through spectral, you know, technology. I don't know. Um, leave it out there with you. I've never heard, heard that, and uh, I would think that would be some of the biggest news in the scientific community. I've never heard a whisper of it. Have you, John, or George? No, that's, I, that's impossible, not on Earth. It has to be a solar system. Well, he said it came in on a meteorite, so... Well, that's interesting. Maybe we'll have to look for that uh, that article and see see what the origin of the story is. But I'd for appreciate... it to be, to be stable and have a handful of it in a meteorite, I I have my doubts that that's probably accurate. But maybe it's a it's, maybe there's a piece of truth there, and it's just a little mixed up. Thanks, Davis. Appreciate it. West of the Rockies, Dale from here in Las Vegas. Hi, Dale. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering. I've read the stories about the flying saucer that Bob Lazar observed, and I'm wondering where are they now, and if the government has them, why wouldn't they use them? Because I can imagine all kinds of good uses for them. Where do you think they are? John, do you think they're at the new Area 51 you were I talking about? I think they're about? probably at the new Area 51. I don't think they'd use them. Uh, they're very careful uh, with, uh, you know, what they do with them. I don't think that uh, we use them for, like, going anywhere or transporting. I think they're still studying them. And if they can glean any technology from it, they're going to use it on a craft or in any 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 capacity that would look normal to any you know earthling if 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 they don't fly the craft themselves if they learn something from the craft that can be used in another craft of a more acceptable shape so you could operate it in broad daylight without uh being under suspicion that that is probably what they do who knows? They might be using them for something they haven't told us about. And I suppose right. if you used them, as a, for example, in a, in a war, in a theater of well, war. The technology and, that uh, Bob worked on with, with those flying saucers is certainly far advanced. We have our own anti-grav technology, which we developed between 1953 and 1955. My father uh, was a major contractor on that development and uh, uh, through his company, Lear Incorporated. So, you know, we had anti-grav, a form of it, in uh, 1955. That's why you never see anything in the news on how we're progressing on anti-grav. We already have it, but it's a secret. I guess the the danger would be if you use it, like, in a war and somebody gets it's shot down, then you got some explaining to do. Thanks, Dale. Thanks for the call. First-time caller, Robert, in Arizona. Hi, Robert. Hey, uh, Mr. Knapp and your guest, uh, good evening to you. Thank you for taking my call. Sure thing. In 2004, when Bob Lazar was on Coast to Coast Radio with Art Bell, the night he uh, talked about Element 115, he mentioned at the last of the hour of the interview, and before they uh, went on the news break, and nobody ever did a follow-up on this, but he said that when Element 115 was, before it was uh, fired up in the reactor, he said that a gas was introduced into the reactor in the next hour when calls were taken. Nobody ever asked what that gas was. Now, well, the gas was what... just the gas was just the matter that the antimatter interacts with. There's it's put in a tuned tube. The, the antimatter, like I know this, I'm just saying this is a, as Bob has told me in the past. The after the after the 115 is bombarded. This is all a closed system. The 115 is bombarded, turns to 116. It decays, releases antimatter. The antimatter travels down a tuned tube, meaning, I guess, what's a tuned tube? Whatever forces, magnetism, electromagnetic. So it doesn't explode because the tube itself is made out of matter. Okay? So it travels down a tuned tube, and it, it interacts the matter that it interacts with to cause the antimatter matter explosion from which the heat is turned to electricity, that matter is gas. That's what the gas is. So I don't think it probably, you know, I don't know what gas that was. It could be hydrogen. It could be anything. It, it's just that's the matter target that the antimatter explodes with. Does that answer your question, Robert? Uh, Robert's gone. We're going to move on. Our wild card line, Roland in Boise, Idaho. How you doing, Roland? Hello, Roland. Are you there? I'm here, George. What's uh, okay. on your mind? Well, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Uh, and I've, I've, um, I'm proud to say that I've uh, uh, read transcripts of all your interviews with uh, Bob Lazar over the years, and uh, so I've kind of started this back in the late 70s. And uh, I've, basically I'm calling to defend uh, his position. Uh, 
uh, Lazar's position uh, that he's a tech head guy, not a you know not a not a politician. So uh, he knows his tech. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to bring up was that if there's standalone uh, energy production, like Bob indicates with his with the technology, uh, what would that do to the world of, of economics today? When you look at Exxon Mobil, who's uh, produced record profits uh, more than any other company in any other industry ever over the past you know uh, year or so, uh, these people would not want a standalone energy producer that uh, can power cars, uh, electric for homes and, and factories. Uh, they've got a good thing going on, and they're not going to uh, allow the status quo to be disrupted. So that's why I'm saying that we, when you see some of the, the, the movies where, you know, people's uh, identities are all messed up and credit cards are deleted and things like that, uh, these people have the power to do that, and I think that's exactly what they've done to Bob Lazar. But uh, would either John or uh, uh, Gene? Mr. Uh, uh, Huff care to expound on how, uh, this standalone energy might affect our world of economics today. John, you want to tackle that one? Yeah, of course. Uh, it would. Uh, it would. Uh, everything would collapse if we were able to use all that. It's the same thing with oil. Oil is uh, abiogenic, which means it's self-produced. It's not made of dead dinosaurs. There's plenty of oil all over the place. We have the greatest reserves of oil under the United States. It's just they want us. Uh, to think that uh, you know that, that we've peaked oil and that we're running out and and that we've got to be careful—that's all baloney. We've got all the oil that we we need. Uh, George, I would just say I think this gentleman's right. I mean, the essence of that is where there where there are people, uh, there are problems. There's greed and, uh, and other concerns, and so cash yes, cow. something fantastic that could be a wonder for all of us to grasp and enjoy in our lives could very well be kept from us because of greed, as tragic as that is. So I think he's absolutely right. Well, if it's real, if the technology exists and we've got it, uh, you know, that that might be a very plausible reason for the cover-up is just to not to upset the economic apple cart. Thanks for the call, Roland. Wild card two line, Bill in Texas. Hi, Bill. Hey, George. How are you doing? Okay. Wonderful show tonight. Thanks. You have a comment and a question for your guest. Uh, Earlier, I was listening to you well, several years ago, I guess, and they were talking about when uh, Jackie Gleason went to Homestead Air Force Base with uh, President Nixon at the time to view uh, dead alien bodies. That's the story. And anyway, just as a uh, curiosity feature, I was stationed there about that time. Of course, I didn't see any dead alien bodies, but there were some. Uh, there was one story of uh, the southern Miami area and Homestead Air Force Base being. Uh, Hovered over by uh, UFOs two particular nights, and they sent you know uh, aircraft up to investigate. And I don't know what became of that, but uh, anyway, I did get on Google and Googled that and, and checked that because I was unaware of uh, Jackie Gleason going down there to check that out. But it was I found that very interesting. And my question is, what do your guests feel as to 2012? Uh, what do you think? Uh, what do they think might happen, if anything at all? And I'll. Hang up and listen to the responses. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Let me take that. It's sure right. baloney. There is no Planet X. There is no Nibiru. And if there is, it's not going to cause any uh, any problem. Uh, whoever is running the show here wants us to keep us in a state of anxiety and, and worry. And, uh, oh, yeah, the world's going to end. But all that's baloney. By the way, if come you read. And go, uh, at just like every other day that's been. By the way, if you read... Uh, if you're referring, you're referring to Nibiru and the Anunnaki from Zechariah Sitchin. If uh, you read Zechariah Sitchin's new last book of that Earth Chronicles series, End of Days, I got some bad news for people like me who were hoping that it would be close enough. First of all, if the if the gods of Eden, of all, if, you know, they don't need to wait for Nibiru to get back here. They could fly here <laughs> if they just wanted to come here. So they don't need to wait uh, if that. Uh, planet exists in a in a in a comet uh, 3600 year orbit around our sun uh, though the anunnaki do not need to wait uh, until it gets close so they could visit the earth certainly if they had that type of technology thousands of years ago they certainly have it now and secondly the way Sitchin has that orbit figured is it's not going to be in the same proximity to the earth as it was 
uh, you know, 2,000 years ago uh, for till like the year 2,900. So in 2012, if you're basing that on the Zechariah,